The cyclone of March 13, 1993, known as the Storm of the Century, was one of the worst and most complex superstorms to affect the United States in modern day history. Affecting over 100 million people, it barreled through 21 states in just 72 hours, spawning a 12-foot storm surge, derecho, tornado outbreak, life-threatening blizzard, and crippling ice storm, all before transitioning into a devastating New England nor'easter. Despite New Age computer models accurately forecasting its approach days in advance, over 300 people still lost their lives in the storm's fury. Today, in the wake of the 30th anniversary, we'll break down the many meteorological components that fell into place, the death and destruction that the superstorm ultimately caused, and how it represented a major success and significant turning point in modern weather forecasting technology. My name is Steve, and this is Weatherbox. Let's dive in. A lot of severe weather happened in the early 1990s in the United States. In August of 1991, Hurricane Bob veered up the Atlantic coast, striking New England as a rare Category 2. One year later, Hurricane Andrew tore through southern Florida as a Category 5 hurricane, causing cataclysmic damage to the city of Homestead. In fact, so many homes were condemned that the government set up a so-called tent city where residents who no longer had a place to live could seek shelter in hundreds of available tents and be provided basic necessities. Many people along the coast were left in varying compromising positions going into 1993. And while a slow warming trend of global temperature was observed throughout the late 80s and early 90s, which could have certainly fueled intense hurricanes, the warming trend suddenly reversed in June of 1991. On the 15th of June, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted with cataclysmic force, ejecting one cubic mile of volcanic material into the stratosphere. Perhaps the scariest part of the eruption was that it occurred as Typhoon Yunya, a Category 2 tropical cyclone, made landfall on Luzon, passing directly over the erupting volcano. As the ash below the troposphere mixed with rain from the typhoon, it fell back to Earth as large droplets of mud, making driving very difficult for last-minute evacuations. But the ash that made it into the stratosphere spread throughout the tropics within a few weeks, and eventually throughout the globe. This effect is measured by something called aerosol optical depth, which is the measure of aerosols like smoke particles, desert dust, sea salt within the stratosphere. And for the next two years after the eruption, the global aerosol optical depth was 10 to 100 times higher, which ultimately meant less energy from the sun was heating the earth, lowering the global temperature by over a full degree Fahrenheit. The thing is, while globally the surface temperature was lower, Winters in the eastern half of the United States are almost always warmer after a major eruption. In an examination of the northern hemisphere winter surface temperature patterns after the 12 largest volcanic eruptions from 1883 to 1992, it was found that in the two winters following these major tropical volcanic eruptions, North America and Eurasia experienced abnormally warm winters, while the Middle East experienced abnormally cold winters. And wouldn't you know it, the winter of January 1992 was the all-time warmest winter on record for much of the U.S. The average temperature for the entire winter across the 48 contiguous states was 36.87 degrees Fahrenheit, with 93.2% of the country reporting warmer than normal temperatures. The following winter, starting in December of 1992, would likely be warmer as well, but less so because it was now 18 months since the Pinatubo eruption. The winter forecast issued by NOAA predicted above-average temperature in the northern and western Western regions of the U.S. with below average temperatures from Texas to Maine, with the highest probability over western North Carolina. One thing's for sure, the year started off with much more snow. On December 10th, a surface low near Virginia moved off the Atlantic coast and became a nor'easter, dropping over 40 inches of snow in western Maryland and four feet of snow in the Berkshires and Green Mountains of Massachusetts and Vermont. The storm surge and heavy rains caused the New York subway system to flood as 70 mile an hour winds tore through the heart of downtown. In early January, six days of continuous blinding snowfall buried Salt Lake City in 26 inches of snow, one of the highest totals in the city's history. On January 20th, a powerful cyclone slammed into the Pacific Northwest, causing 75 mile an hour winds in Seattle and bringing widespread destruction to the Pacific Northwest coast. But much like how Mount Pinatubo had many smaller eruptions before the big one, the worst snowstorm of the year was yet to come. 
By the beginning of March, temperatures were fairly mild across the Midwest and Southeast, and as the first week progressed, an intense ridge began to build over the Pacific. The warm air wasn't limited just to Southern California. On March 9th, it was 70 in Denver, 85 in Dallas, 73 in Birmingham, and 72 in Raleigh. A stationary front slowly sagged south over the course of the few days, allowing cooler air to spill further south towards the Gulf of Mexico. But the Meteorological Operations Division of the National Weather Service was keeping an eye on the weather models for the week ahead, and the output was a bit concerning. Now, if you're watching this video, you're probably at least somewhat familiar with weather forecasting models. They can predict the future, and if you really want to have fun on a Friday night, pull up the latest GFS run, go to 350 hours out, and see what physics-defying weather system is going to strike your area within 10 days' time. But, in case you don't know, a weather forecasting model is quite simply a computer program that contains the mathematical equations that govern physics and thermodynamics in our atmosphere. The program is based on a three-dimensional grid of points that represents a different point in space. These points are then given initial conditions from weather observations, such as wind speed, temperature, dew point, and air pressure. The output data from these equations is then assimilated into the computer model at each point on the grid, and the equations are stepped forward in time. Obviously, the further out you try to predict, the less accurate the model's going to be. In the early 1990s, the three main models used by the MOD for forecasting were the Medium Range Forecast Model, the United Kingdom Meteorology Office Model, and the European Center for Medium Range Forecast Model, or more passionately known as the Euro. Now, weather prediction isn't just reading the output of models. It takes a great deal of knowledge and skilled subjective interpretation of forecast models to accurately predict a weather event, and this was much truer in the early 1990s. The first sign that a storm could impact the eastern U.S. came at the conclusion of the Zero-Z model runs on March 8, 1993. You're looking at a forecast map issued by the MOD Weather Forecast Branch based on the 132, 108, and 84-hour MRF and UK MET models, and the 144, 120, and 96-hour Euro forecast. That's a lot of numbers. These numbers that you see on the screen refer to the model name and the forecasted central pressure of the storm system. So for instance, M stands for Medium Range Forecast Model, or MRF, and 101 stands for 1001 millibars. The low was forecasted to make landfall near Mobile on Saturday, March 13th, and move up through New England as a nor'easter on Sunday the 14th. Now, five days out was a very far forecast for 1993, and the results were greeted with skepticism by forecasters. But over the next 48 hours, the models held the line, but with slight differences in cyclone location. The Zero-Z March 10th UK MET model now showed the low centered over northern Georgia on Saturday the 13th, but the MRF model had it over Savannah, and the Euro had it off the west coast of Florida. It was unclear how far south the low would develop, but everything else indicated that a historic winter storm was falling into place. The models were in agreement that a major upper-level trough would dig down over the eastern half of the United States, with a jet streak or an area of fast-moving winds in the jet stream centered over the Great Lakes. These three pieces of the puzzle appeared to be in place, and while the exact position and path of the low was still to be determined, it would likely be historic. As the day progressed on March 10th, MOD forecasters decided to issue summary statements at six-hour intervals to the weather community. Terms were used such as unusually severe and perhaps record-breaking, and the 16Z statement on Thursday the 11th stated the storm could be of historic proportions along the East Coast with potentially record-setting snows over the interior portions. Now, obviously, when the National Weather Service uses language like this, the media takes notice, and by the end of the night, the impending Ending blizzard was on national news. Throughout the day on the 10th, an intense ridge aloft was building off the Pacific coast, often a precursor to an amplified digging trough to the east. One more huge improvement in weather forecasting came on December 7th, 1992, when the MOD began using ensemble forecasts. See, prior to December 7th, a single model run was conducted each day for a 10-day period at the highest resolution possible, outputting a single forecast. But with an ensemble forecast, 14 individual model runs are conducted with very slightly differing initial conditions, outputting 14 individual 10-day forecasts. This cemented the fundamental ideology that medium-range forecasts are stochastic in nature or contain random distributions that cannot be precisely predicted. There is no single solution to a forecast, rather a range of possible solutions, and averaging these solutions out can help get rid of some of the forecasting errors. This is most apparent 
to the everyday person when looking at forecasted hurricane tracks on the news. There isn't a single precise line that the hurricane is predicted to follow. It's an expanding cone that gets larger the further out the hurricane is from landfall. The MRF Ensemble product greatly assisted forecasters in predicting the heavy snowfall, as well as it likely being an East Coast storm. There was also one new parameter called Conditional Probability of Snow, or CPOS, which consistently showed potential for heavy snow accumulation along the spine of the Blue Ridge Mountains. But the Ensemble MRF also had some flaws. Most Importantly, it failed to predict the rapid strengthening of the low as it moved ashore from the Gulf of Mexico. Instead, it predicted the low intensifying greatly over New England. This is significant because the waters in the Gulf of Mexico were a whopping 3 degrees Celsius warmer than normal for that time of year. At 8 a.m. Eastern on March 11th, the surface low that would be the superstorm formed near Monterey, Mexico, drifting off to the east. It was at this time that the winter storm watches started being issued by weather forecast offices, offering many areas in the path of the storm nearly 50 hours of lead time. Within the next 24 hours, two individual shortwave troughs, or these smaller kinks in the jet stream quickly swung down from the northern Rockies, the southeastern trough reaching the Gulf first. Winds within this jet streak were moving at a blazing 140 knots. This greatly increased vorticity to the east or the spin in the atmosphere which was now sitting over the developing cyclone allowing air to rise. The area to the east of the low was a strong barrow clinic zone or an area with a tight temperature gradient aided by the abnormally warm waters near a southward moving cold air mass east of the Rockies. Every single parameter was in place for explosive cyclone growth, and by the morning of the 12th, cyclogenesis was well underway. The central pressure of the low began falling rapidly as it drifted to the east. General cloudiness was observed on satellite near the low center, slowly forming a comma head shape, a feature typical of extratropical cyclones. At 4 p.m. Eastern, light snow was falling across Alabama and Mississippi with enough accumulation to cover the spring daffodils in full bloom. By the evening of March 12th, the cyclone was off the coast of New Orleans with a squall line starting to form along the associated cold front. Southerly winds formed a strong low level jet ahead of the cold front which pumped tons of warm moist air into the cyclone causing the rapid development of rain along the warm front as well as near the cyclone center. These strong stormy extratropical cyclones are more often than not found over the Great Plains in the Midwest because that's where all the ingredients come together in spring. The one benefit that these land-based cyclones have is the land that they traverse over provides friction which actually slows the wind at the surface down quite a lot. Derechos still impact the Midwest which are fast moving bands of thunderstorms with destructive winds, we're talking like 80 miles an hour. August 10th, 2020, May 12th, 2022, there have been some historic derechos, but all of those were over land. This explosive squall line with embedded supercells was flying to the east over warm ocean waters and would likely strike the west coast of Florida around midnight in complete darkness while the people at risk were asleep. To make matters worse, this derecho was not that well forecasted. While a tornado watch was issued several hours before the derecho hit, the squall line itself only took a couple hours to form. This wasn't like a tropical cyclone, where the perpetual rain bands exist circulating around the center and you could see it approaching from 500 miles away. With mid-latitude cyclones in unstable atmospheres, storm development happens incredibly fast. And while severe thunderstorm warnings with 90 mile an hour wind tags were issued in the 10 o'clock hour, most people just didn't see those warnings. They were in bed. On top of this, the cold front itself, located about 100 miles west of the derecho, contained additional 70 mile an hour winds, so it would be a long, windy night on the west coast of Florida. At around this time in the evening, the trough in the jet stream aloft exhibited an extreme negative tilt, indicating extremely fast winds aloft and intense vorticity, fueling the explosive cyclogenesis occurring underneath. The low continued to deepen as it approached Apalachicola, and at 11 p.m., the fully formed derecho moved ashore in western Florida. 95 mile an hour winds battered Clearwater, causing a 12 foot storm surge to the north at Pine Island. Dozens of homes up and down the coast were destroyed by the storm surge. The line of storms extended down into Cuba, hitting Havana with over 100 mile an hour wind gusts, with a reanalysis done by the Institute of Meteorology of Cuba estimating 130 
mile an hour wind gusts. Cuba saw the worst of the damage, suffering a billion dollar economic loss from the storm. Around 40,000 homes were at least partially destroyed. Back in Florida, 11 tornadoes touched down across the state from the embedded supercells, with the maximum rating being F2. One of these F2s hit a mobile home park in Chiefland, killing three. Another tornado actually went through a tent city, where people who lost their homes in Hurricane Andrew were currently living in tents. It was a nightmarish scenario in Florida. As the squall line was tearing through the heart of Florida, the low center moved ashore near Apalachicola, setting an all-time low pressure record for Tallahassee at just 976 millibars. The moisture from the southerly low-level jet was now condensing at an explosive rate to the north, causing the first ever thunder snow in Mobile, Alabama. Blizzard warnings were in place for the entirety of the Appalachian Mountains through Pennsylvania, and heavy snow warnings were extended into extreme northwestern Alabama, where it became apparent that all-time snowfall records would easily be broken. The resulting snowflakes were huge wet clusters, piling up quickly at rates over 3 inches an hour, all during 45 mile an hour winds. James Spann was on the air throughout the night in Birmingham, Alabama, keeping residents updated as the temperatures plummeted into the mid-20s. This fantastic moment was caught on camera, audible proof of the rare thundersnow. Hours damage, straight line wind damage in Tampa, and uh, if you can hear that, uh, we've had a tremendous a uh, lightning crash uh, outside the station here, part of this thunder snowstorm we are experiencing. One of the camera operators who is out in the blizzard also caught this fantastic moment. You, you tell me that that's Valley Avenue there, and I can barely recognize that because the snow is so heavy. I'm uh, exactly there. There was the flash right there of the lightning. It is struck very close to me. With power lines falling all throughout the state and very few plows to clear the six inches already on the roads, it was clear that the blizzard was an unprecedented, life-threatening situation for Alabama. By 5 a.m., the low center was over Vidalia, Georgia, with the central pressure at 971 millibars and falling, a pressure on par with a Category 2 hurricane. The warm, moist air from the Atlantic was getting sucked into the low at tremendous speeds, meeting the 6,000-foot peaks of the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina and Tennessee, then getting forced up the peaks, creating the worst blizzard conditions seen in years. Somehow, dozens of people were hiking along the peaks of Smoky Mountains National Park, where just a few days prior, the weather had been beautiful and mild. Among those hiking was a group of students from Michigan who were practicing survival skills using minimalistic shelters and carrying little to no gear. They woke up early on the 13th to collapsed tents buried under three feet of snow. Stuck for several days, they suffered severe frostbite and barely survived, requiring hand and foot amputations. Those that made it back to their cars were luckier, as the vehicle became a suitable, livable shelter while waiting for the National Guard. In Asheville, residents woke up to over a foot of snow on the ground, and with winds funneling into the French Broad River Valley, whiteout conditions made travel impossible. By 9 a.m., the low center was over Raleigh, North Carolina at just 966 millibars. State officials in Pennsylvania mobilized the National Guard and closed down interstates across the entire state prior to the blizzard striking, a move only made possible by the 50 hours of lead time given by forecasters. For the first time ever, New York officials had activated the emergency alert system for a blizzard warning, pushing it to all radios and television sets statewide. One thing that was still uncertain for cities on the East Coast was the exact location of the rain-snow line. A path difference of 20 miles can be the difference between getting an inch of rain or a foot of snow, and with many major metropolitan areas on the East Coast being in such close proximity to each other, correctly predicting the rain-snow line was crucial. Yet another advancement in weather technology that played a huge role in forecasting this event was the implementation of WSR-88D radar systems, which offered a much higher resolution, as well as the addition of a velocity product. One of the first operational WSR-88D systems in the country was located in Sterling, Virginia, which covered the DC metropolitan area. Individual bands of snow and ice pellets were tracked precisely across eastern Virginia, and now casts were issued every hour to warn those in the heavy band's path. Not only that, but the weather forecasting office was able to take ground-based observations of where that rain-snow line was and compare it to the radar imagery that they were receiving at the time. The low center was now approaching the greater DC area, and with six inches of snow already on the ground, the associated 70-mile-an-hour wind gusts were grinding the city to a complete stop. The mixture of sleet and snow made travel impossible in the nation's capital. Strong winds 
winds blowing out of the east funneled ocean waters into coastal towns in Delaware and New Jersey, such as Seabright. Many of these towns had not yet recovered from the December nor'easter just three months prior. To the west of D.C., the ridges and valleys of western Virginia, western Maryland, and the Appalachian Plateau of West Virginia were getting buried in more snow than they had seen in decades. Because the path of the low center stayed west of the Atlantic coast over North Carolina, which is not really typical of a nor'easter, most of the moisture and cold air flowed over the Appalachian Plateau, resulting in record 24-hour snow totals. In Pennsylvania, even though interstates were closed across the state, City officials in Pittsburgh decided not to cancel their St. Patrick's Day parade scheduled for that morning. In fact, it was the only parade on the entire East Coast that wasn't canceled. By noon, the snow was falling at rates of 3 inches an hour. Hundreds of vehicles were left stranded on city streets. 23.6 inches of snow fell within those 24 hours, a record that still stands today. To the east in Latrobe, 3 feet of snow fell with drifts as high as 10 feet. As Saturday progressed, the southeasterly winds ferociously battered the coast of Long Island, New York. Many residents along the coast waited until the blizzard had already begun to consider leaving, and that made matters much more difficult. In the afternoon, with 10 to 20 foot waves already crashing onto the coast, officials began transporting tons of sand to coastal areas, dumping it via bulldozers in an attempt to stop further erosion. While the wind and sleet was pelting New York City, unfathomable snow was falling to the north in upstate New York. For cities like Syracuse, which had seen over 125 inches of snow that winter already, the superstorm was just adding insult to injury. Well, actually it was like adding injury to injury. The day before, Wegmans sold 300% of their daily average sales of merchandise. Some customers of Video King Rental Service were renting out seven VHS movies at a time to watch during the blizzard, which wasn't even enough because for 48 hours the snow on that northwestern side of the low didn't stop. Enhanced by moisture from Lake Ontario, the greater Syracuse area saw nearly 43 inches of snow by Monday morning. By noon on Sunday the 14th, the low center had passed near Boston, holding steady at 962 millibars. The entirety of New England proceeded to get 10 to 20 inches of snow within that 24-hour period, with higher elevations receiving double that amount. All major airports, interstates, and turnpikes were closed. All state highways were impassable. By the time the storm had finally moved out of Maine on Sunday evening, the entire eastern third of the United States was completely out of sorts. The largest snowfall happened on Mount LeConte in Tennessee, a 6,600-foot peak in the Smoky Mountains. Between 50 and 60 inches officially fell at the peak, an inescapable amount of snow even for the most experienced hikers. Mount Mitchell to the east wasn't too far behind, seeing 50 inches which took an entire month to completely melt. All-time low record pressure readings were set in Newark, Philly, D.C., Wilmington, and Wilkes-Barre. 60,000 lightning strikes were observed across the eastern U.S. during the storm, many occurring within snow squalls. An estimated 318 people lost their lives in various ways, freezing to death while hiking in the Smokies, getting washed out to sea by the derecho-induced storm surge in Florida, getting into a car accident while attempting to drive through the freezing rain. Many people in Florida failed to appreciate the magnitude of the impending storm because it was extra tropical in nature. The general feeling was that if it wasn't a hurricane, it was no big deal. The storm caused over $5 billion in damage across 21 states, affecting nearly 30% of the entire U.S. population. But amidst all the chaos, the Meteorology Operations Division, in conjunction with the local forecasting offices, absolutely nailed their forecasts. Retrospective analyses of the event shows that medium-range forecast models, especially the new Ensemble products, were critical in predicting where the greatest snow totals were going to be, and Ensemble products are still widely used for weather forecasting today. Not only that, but the usage of the WSR-88D radar in Sterling, Virginia showed the forecasters how much more information they could give residents in the forecast area when it came to a snowstorm. We're not talking about rotating winds in a supercell thunderstorm visible via velocity products. These were primarily convective squalls that produced snow and sleet, and still the new radar system provided so much more useful information. It will likely be a great while until we see another snowstorm of that magnitude make landfall on the Gulf Coast and then right up the East Coast like the Superstorm did in 93.
But whenever that happens next, we will be able to predict it. And there better not be anyone hiking in the Smokies who gets caught off guard by the storm. With all our modern technology, there's just no excuse for not being weather aware. If you guys have any personal stories about the Superstorm of 93, please share it in the comments below. My favorite thing is to read your guys' personal stories about weather events that I've covered. And if you want to learn more about weather through past historical events, definitely subscribe, like, and comment. That helps me out more than you can imagine, and I will see you guys soon.